people will now say Africans have always written science fiction, and in a sense it's true. But uh, uh, the current wave of Afro science fiction started to bubble up from online magazines, blogs, um, a new pulp magazine called Jungle Jim out of South Africa, Chimarenga in South Africa. By 2008, 2009, it was starting to percolate. But it was not until some print anthologies came out that we began to see it surfacing uh, where we are right now. And um, Lagos 2060 was a collective, uh, Iodeli Eric Babu, uh, pulled together from about 2009, introducing architects and writers to envisage Lagos 100 years after independence. Uh, and the introduction to that science fiction anthology was the country remains bogged down in the present, enslaved to its past and quite shy of its future. With science fiction, writers who dare the future give courage to others. Now, some salient features there. Um, the past is not exactly being celebrated there. You're enslaved to it. And it's science fiction daring the future that is perceived as a way ahead for that anthology. Um, first published, though conceived uh, after Lagos 2060, Ivor Hartman, who was a paperless uh, Zimbabwean who had to escape Mugabe, now lives in Sweden. Um, Ivor wrote in his introduction to Afro SF, which was a massive anthology, uh, and it, uh, every anthology has to prove something, and that anthology proved that great numbers of Africans were indeed writing science fiction. The introduction to that said, sci-fi is the only genre that enables African writers to envision a future from our African perspective. If you can't see and relay an understandable vision of the future, your vision will be co-opted by someone else's vision, one that will not necessarily have your best interests at heart. So science fiction was seen as a way of using the new technology that Africa was mastering and using it to envisage a different narrative for Africa, one that was controlled by Africans. Okay. They were not using the phrase Afrofuturism for any of that, Afro-SF. Futurism um, and Afrofuturism, uh, there's a book that came out about the same time by Yatasha Womack from America called uh, Afrofuturism, the World of Black, Sci-Fi, and Fantasy Culture. And the... Um, Loose definition that she accepted by Ingrid Lafleur was, I generally define Afrofuturism as a way of imagining possible futures through a black cultural lens. The focus there is still on the future, but it's, uh, the whole vision of Afrofuture in that book is much more about providing representation of black youth, primarily in America actually, finding someone and seeing themselves reflected in the stories and having a future in the stories. Um, we are now in 2017, and a, a focus on the future is not actually how it kind of worked out. Um, I'm involved with something called the African Speculative Fiction Society. That's its URL there. Uh, and it's got lots of resources. And its best resource is a database run by Wally Talabi. Uh, that is a database of just about every publication we can find in the broad field of speculative fiction, fantastic fiction, horror fiction. It's a marvelous thing Wally does. I do not know where he finds the stories. Basically because Africa, in general, I would say is, is just much less parochial about genre boundaries. So literary magazines are just as likely to carry a science fiction story as a science fiction magazine. And you simply have to read everything that comes out to find them. Uh, and Wally apparently does, and also invites people to contribute. Um, in calendar year 2017, by some stroke of luck for people who are mathematically illiterate like me, there were precisely 100 works listed in the database. And 35 of them were science fiction. Now, if anyone had asked me what's the percentage of science fiction stories, I would have said probably only about a third. The rest are fantasy, the rest are horror, the rest are interstitial or are literary and very difficult to classify. Um, and I would say uh, I'm not going to catalog all 70-odd uh, of those works. 
but many, many of them are not looking to the future at all. They're actually more concerned with Africa's past. Okay. Now, at, uh, at the risk of doing too much white mansplaining, I'm going to move on to uh, the interview series, 100 African Writers. And I'm just going to give you a taste of what they say. Um, I would say that, by and large, most of the writers are much more concerned with reaching back to the pre-colonial past or their family's heritage or their own indigenous religion than they are about dreaming about futures. Um, some talk about it, but on the whole, that's not their focus. That gentleman is Dilman Dilla from Uganda. He, uh, he's the director and writer of a wonderful literary metafictional film called Her Broken Shadow, but he's also the author of a very influential single author collection called A Killing in the Sun. He was nominated for many prizes and awards. He's uh, an indispensable figure in African science fiction. He founded a magazine, La We Know. He, uh, if there's an anthology going, he shows up in it. He's in Imagine Africa 500. He's in the short story day Africa science fiction anthology, uh, Terra Incognita. He's, um, he's just everywhere. If there's a, a collection going, he's in it, uh, including even the Gerald Crack Award for uh, stories about gender. Um, this is what he has to say about this general topic, and much more. In his interview, half the interview is about his researches into the Bach Swayze people, into stories about individual rocks in his part of Uganda. But this is what he said on this subject. I want to bring mythologies that I heard as a child and things that have been happening in our communities into the mainstream. When you talk about an Abiba, they are always considered evil. It's considered witchcraft. But people will gladly watch Harry Potter. Africa can get confidence in its own past and mythologies if some things like this become part of popular culture. And that's obviously a focus in his work. Uh, from Malawi, Andrew C. Dakalira. Now, Andrew uh, is, uh, he had a long novella published in the second Afro-SF collection, which is novellas, uh, set on the shores of Lake Malawi, a, a, a long, long story uh, about aliens. But he says, I don't really see myself as a science fiction writer per se. And in fact, I think I've only met one or two of the 100 African writers who would say that. Um, because some of the other stories I've written are not science fiction. Some of them ha have to do with witchcraft. And that is about as mild a statement as you're going to get of the fact that so many stories look back to traditional beliefs, things that, I mean, that word witchcraft probably should come with quotes because it won't exist in his uh, home language. But uh, for our benefit, he's using that word witchcraft. Um, <clears throat> One of the uh, women who did say she was a science fiction writer, however, was Ayodele Olofina Tuade. And uh, she's published in Luminous Worlds, which is a new science fiction magazine out of South Africa. Uh, and she's a, uh, she's a publisher herself. She got a grant to publish YA fiction in South Africa. She uh, was nominated for a very prestigious uh, Young Adult Award for her science fiction. And indeed, basically, what's emerged over time is that her subject is traditional belief. And I did ask her why that might be and why so many of the writers I was talking to seemed to be talking about a traditional belief fiction. And her response was, I don't know why a lot of African writers are talking about those stories, because I can't speak for everyone, but I know why I do it. I'm exploring the past because there aren't a lot of books telling you the truth about your past or how you became who you are. I think Africa is exploring its past, its pre-colonial past. Let me be specific about that more than ever. We haven't realized how much impact colonialism had on us as a people. Uh, so without going into Ngugi Wationgo's uh, decolonizing the mind, without going into uh, the, the, uh, 
the very focused efforts to shift South Africa, which has been congratulating itself for so long about doing away with apartheid without doing anything about the legacy of colonialism. The, the, the very focused efforts on decolonization there, without going anywhere near that, it's still very plain that there's a, a, a strand in all of this of going back to the world that existed before at the point of a gun, African cultures, plural, were changed in different ways. There's a, a yearning to at least reconnect, rediscover, revivify, think about, speculate with, have fun with, enjoy all that past. There's Derek, great big strapping friendly person. He writes very anti-feminist fiction. I had to talk to him about it. Um, he's <laughs> extremely nice. And we were talking about what he'd written and, uh, and the situation in Uganda, which is quite unique because uh, I've never met so many confident, forthright, and self-actualizing women writers in Africa than in Uganda. And that's the direct result of Femrite, which is uh, it's an organization that's been going 20 years. So it's no accident there are a bunch of really self-actuating women writers in Uganda 20 years after Femrite started. And it is really week by week the literary center for everyone, including the blokes. So Derek would have at least feminism uh, in his purview. I asked him what was distinctively African about that though, and this was his response. Distinctively African is that we are retelling the stories that we were told. That's number one, the myths we were told as kids. You can't write in a mainstream way, but those myths are being lost if we don't write about them. First and foremost, it might be science fiction, but what you are writing is African folklore, at least to a degree, something you are told round a bonfire or by your parents or someone talking about village life. Um, an Ugandan I didn't quote from in this show is uh, Muzingizi uh, Ray Robert. Uh, and his whole interview is, I couldn't stop him. He was telling me all sorts of stories about all these kingdoms. He traveled 360 kilometers on a bus. His job in a distant town in Uganda is to run the local taxi drivers association. And he set up a private library of 700 volumes. And he was talking and talking. And so I said, so, so what you're trying to, are you, are you just trying to t um, use these stories in fiction or are you trying to save them? And it's, it, it doesn't make for a very interesting response when somebody drives their finger into a table and says, save them and nothing else. But that's what he was doing. He was retelling the stories to keep them alive. Um, that's Denise Kavuma. She's a medical doctor. She started out writing really rather humorous stories about being a medic. And um, she's a fan of James White and wants to write medical science fiction at some point. But in fact, when you look at what she's written and published, it is increasingly drawing um, she began to tell me about one of the stories which personified the, uh, uh, the Ganda people's legend of Walambe, who is trouble and death, and uh, how she suddenly just got, being a doctor and seeing death, how she got really interested in what death would be, how you would personify it. And this is what she said about Walambe and why she wrote about him. I remember wondering how come I have never seen stories about our own traditional characters or the origins of the Ganda people. These stories are not personalized, dignified, expounded upon. So for her, that's, I think you can hear in all of these people, that's a real motivation to write. That's what's driving it. Um, a slightly different situation here. Chikodili Ebilumadu. Now, Chikodili wrote the story that Chinelo Onwaulu, who's the uh, literary editor of Omenana magazine, the, uh, uh, Africa's premier science fiction journal, uh, online, for free, look it up, you can go there, uh, is Story Story. Story Story is set in the present day, written in Igblish, which is a combination of Ibu and English. It's a jokey thing. Um, it reads like it's traditional fiction or an oral story, but in fact, it's um, a, a story of magic and myth working in the present day, told in a very flavorful verse. Her Kane Prize nominated story was a horror story, 
that was published in a collection called African Monsters, edited by Margaret Helga Rottir. Um, so she's achieved something. But uh, Chico de Lee has been living now in England for some time. And for her, she, she would, she'd been brought up in one of those conservative African households that really believed the English did things properly. You know, one of the greatest influences on African science fiction is Enid Blyton. Um, they mentioned Enid Blyton over and over. Uh, the magic faraway tree. Because Enid Blyton, there would be no, nothing untoward. It was definitely proper. It must be a classic because the English read it. And the net result is sometimes when you're editing African science fiction, you say, why are these people sounding like children in the 1920s? Um, but anyway, with all of that, she came to England and suddenly discovered that no, the English do not do things properly at all. Uh, my dreams of England had no foundation and basis. I couldn't reconcile them with what I was seeing. Since I couldn't be English in that way, I had to dig around in my own psyche. I started looking back at history, my own history. Both my grandmothers were alive, and taking steps toward them made me aware how much I was like a little grain of sand in the hourglass of time. I'd taken my grandparents, language, culture, all for granted. I had to figure out what I wanted to be in myself. So in a, in second wave of diaspora, the diaspora of all these prosperous, educated for three generations, uh, Africans, Nigerians, particularly moving around the world. There is the need of the diaspora person to reach back, connect, and suddenly find these riches to be used. This is Eugene. Uh, Eugene uh, did a degree. I first met Eugene in the African reading group. Uh, he did a degree at the University of Manchester. And he's now firmly ensconced as an illustrator and writer and all sorts of good things. He had a series of very traditional stories set in the forest, the forest familiar to those of you who may have heard of Amos Tutuola, um, and then has set up these weird uh, psychedelic drug near future series that's published in Okada books. Uh, this is what he said at the AK Festival in November of 2016. With African speculative fiction, it's going to be a wild ride, a very wild ride, because the elements we have to play with are limitless and relatively new. You have works drawn from indigenous cultures, from oral traditions, and finally, somebody mentioning it, from projected futures. Everything is going to come together to make one hell of a ride. I think the world should be prepared for what's coming out of Africa in the next few years. And I rest my case. <laughs> you may not have realized it, but corrected for inflation, Black Panther is the fifth biggest film opening in history. Um, what that means is all those people who don't like or know anything about science fiction but make science fiction movies because they want to make money will now be making Afrofuturist fantasies. <laughs> they will be coming out of your, your and my ears. And it will make possibly some of the people we've heard speaking now um, rich, if they're smart and they get in there quickly enough. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about, and it is this peculiar genius of Stan Lee that I don't like a single comic book he wrote, but the core ideas of every one of them, there's some kind of genius. And this lines up so exactly with what uh, the market in Africa was certainly yearning for. I, I've, I saw the movie, I went, eh, it's a good Marvel movie, and I found I, I couldn't have an opinion. I just didn't have an opinion, because I said that the test of, of this movie for me is going to be what Africans make of it. The trailer hadn't looked too good. People in the Rift Valley talking Zosha didn't bode too well. Uh, it's a little bit like having, uh, shooting a movie in New York and everyone speaks Spanish and saying, well, Mexico's in North America, isn't it? Um, I looked at the designs of the costumes and I said, that's all over the place. That's Africa as a single country. Let's just grab any design we can. Whatever minor faults, and uh, there's been huge amounts of discussion. For example, the Isosha language was imposed on it by civil war. The, the first film to feature Black Panther, um, they decided they had to keep it. They didn't want to. Um, 
it's, it's, that's the film where they pronounced Lagos, Lagos throughout. Um, but basically, uh, the outpouring of love online has been remarkable. And the character of Killmonger, the embodiment of the fault line between African culture and Afro-American culture, was an incredibly brave step that a lot of people are going online and writing about with a great deal of, finding a great deal of meaning and richness, so much so that this is being called, you know, uh, a, a rap, uh, um, what is it? Um, uh, I've forgotten the quote. Between the diaspora and Africa are reaching out. But the feature that strikes me is that actually there's not anything in the future in it. It looks like it's the future, but in fact, Wakanda has its history behind it. The traditional beliefs are validated. Those blue flowers work. The, um, the traditional medicine that can make you Black Panther and then just as easily for combat take being Black Panther away. Traditional beliefs are something like them validated. Uh, and this wonderful idea of this secret kingdom, this wonderful high, highly advanced culture hiding itself away from colonialism. Any issues that uh, the, the, the people have been having with the plot, they're busy appropriating the plot, rewriting it, and presenting you with a slightly different Wakanda that works, and they're very happy with it. Um, and the result, I mean, the, the online discussions have been extraordinary. This is Mehul Gahil, who's one of the Nairobi beatniks. Uh, they love modernism in Nairobi, and they will quote Allen Ginsberg at you. Um, it's just great. And Mahil went to see it, um, and I'll read you some of his. Uh, saw it at the Garden City Mall IMAX, which is the biggest one here in Nairobi. The ticketing area was an utter functioning chaos. There must have easily been over 200 people. No space to walk. People standing in long lines to buy tickets for Tuesday. All shows for today and tomorrow are sold out. Someone had sent part of their entourage to the downtown IMAX, five kilometers away, and were calling up to see if there were seats. People had come dressed for the occasion. This was not even the premiere, just a normal show. But everyone was out to strut their Wakanda style, and he showed up in t-shirt, blue jeans, and white sneakers. Oh, dear. Um, the crowds at the IMAX tend to be multiracial, upper-class yuppies. Today, it was largely local, largely African, largely Wakandan. I think many who had never been to this mall or this theater were here, and they took it over. The word on Black Panther is out there. This is very clearly going to be the biggest box office hit in Kenya. Boom, boom. Thrills. Now, to sort of tease out something that I can see going on there. When I first went to Africa to teach in 2009, and for a long time afterward, 2011, certainly where I was teaching, which was Jalingo in the Northeast, no cinemas. But the capital city, Abuja, didn't have a cinema. Um, movies, why would you want to go to a movie? You can see all the movies you want to on a screen, on the computer, on your tablet, on your phone. Um, and then very suddenly, there seemed to be an awful lot of cinemas. And what had happened is the movie going public had bifurcated a little bit. And there was definitely a cinema going component and definitely another component. Now, this guy, um, C.J. Fiery Obasi, he's uh, a producer, director, writer. He's doing post-production on a new movie based on one of Nnedi Okorafor's stories filmed in Nigeria. And uh, he was talking to me a bit about why um, it, it's, the market's bifurcating. There was a time in Nigeria when the cinemas closed. Now they're coming back, but we're still struggling with the audience. The cinema-going audience is not the same as the DVD audience old, traditional Nollywood. The cinema-going audience wants to watch Iron Man 5. Basically, they want to see these huge spectacles, not always Marvel, but certainly Marvel is in there. I saw Thor Ragnarok in Lagos, and they loved it with the same you know, response. They laughed in all the same places. They got excited in all the same places. The movies are enjoyed for the sense of spectacle. And that kind of means that after all this time, what perhaps inadvertently Marvel has done is generate a new movie-going market for this film. So very suddenly, Africa is ready 
for Black Panther, the screens are up, they're able to see it. And it's a kind of new audience. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip part of the talk. I was gonna talk about a bit more about, do people wanna hear a little bit more about the difference between DVD and cinema? Time, I should skip, okay. Uh, I thought I'd show you this because I still think that Black Panther could be uh, passed over more thoroughly. Joe Kanna, who's a, um, had a hand in the script, he plays Black Panther's dad. He's a very distinguished theater director and everything else in South Africa, and he has a script credit. But what you're looking at there is how, um, in a slightly out of copyright version, Africans view Batman. And uh, a Batman in Africa, you're not going to wear skin-tight black lycra. It's just not going to work for you. And you're going to wear clothing that is much more appropriate. If you're walking around shirtless uh, and, and very loose-fitting traditional shorts, then you're not likely to wear a face mask. So this Batman doesn't have to hide. His backstory is that he was an enforced child soldier. And he becomes the Batman, and he has his bat ears. This wonderful creature is the African Joker. So I think there's, there's, um, uh, there's room for even more input and uh, local uh, understanding in these big movies and big characters, and I look forward to it. Now, this is Dominda de la again, because we are talking about Afrofuturism, which is a term that was coined um, really uh, much more in the American context than the African. Um, the film, The Last Angel of History, that came out in 1992. Uh, a British film, a documentary about Afrofuturism. Really good film. Talks about all the, the music and the design and the writing, but it's all American. It does not mention a single African. Uh, in, when the uh, magic realism boom of the early 90s was happening in Ghana and Nigeria, at least, uh, Ben Okri was publishing Sil Cheney Coker was publishing, B. Kojo Lang was publishing, but people didn't know that. So we're dealing with a term that initially at least, and let's remember please that the origin of term is never its meaning. And the, the meaning of Afrofuturism has shifted. Even so, this is Dilman de la, uh, after the impact of Black Panther, writing about how he sees the situation. I know Afrofuturism is a broad term. I don't even know what it means. And for that reason, I don't like it. The problem, I think, is in the word future. When they label a work Afrofuturistic, what do they, do they mean it's about the future of Africa or African people, right? Often portrayed positively. They also mean it's about the present without all the stereotypes and headline calamities. And that is about a history, which is nothing like the horribly racist picture colonialists painted. For the last few years, the dominant fantasy has been that something turns Africa into, well, a utopia, for want of a better word. A place where things work, with no poverty as we know it, no colonialism, where nobody feels inferior because of their dark skin color. It has become my favorite daydream, and I'll leave it you to imagine why it hurts when I snap out of it. I begin to feel like Afrofuturism is becoming something like a mind control drug. Something like a religion that makes you endure a horrible life with promises of a paradise after death. That's on his blog. And on that interesting note, I'll skip to this, which is Dilman's, um, one of his digital artworks that he's animated himself. It's a little boy with his pet robot dragon walking through the streets of Kampala. And I'll leave you on that note. Thanks. <laughs> 